Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute. Hello, and welcome to episode 252 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. Much of early American history comprises stories of empire. They're stories about how different native, European, and Euro-American nations vied for control of North American territory, resources, and people. And this episode presents us with one of these imperial stories. Specifically, we're going to investigate the world of the 18th century Scottish Highlands and how the 12,000 Highland soldiers it sent to North America shaped the course of the British Empire during the Seven Years' War and the American Revolution. Leading us on this investigation is Matthew P. Jeanick, an assistant professor of history at the United States Naval Academy and the author of The Fatal Land, War, Empire, and the Highland Soldier in British America. Now, as Matthew helps us explore the world of the 18th century Scottish Highlands and the military role Highlanders played in early North America, he reveals information about the Scottish Highlands and Highland culture, how Scottish Highlanders both resisted and supported the British Empire during the 18th century, and details about the experiences Highland soldiers had in North America during the Seven Years' War and the American War for Independence. But first, I have a couple of conferences and speaking engagements coming up in late September and early October, which means I get to visit new cities and towns, and I'd love to plan a few meetups while I'm visiting those areas so that we can meet and get together. Now, I still have some logistics to work out, but here's the list of places I intend to travel to. Washington, D.C. in late September, State College, Pennsylvania in early October, and in mid-October, I'll be in Atlanta, Georgia. So, do you happen to live in Washington, D.C., State College, or Atlanta? If so, could you help me plan a meetup? I ask because it's always really helpful when someone who knows an area can suggest a place for us to meet up, because otherwise, I resort to using Google Maps and Yelp reviews, and while that's an okay method to choose a meetup spot, it's really no replacement for first-hand knowledge of a place. So, If you have first-hand knowledge of Washington, D.C., State College, or Atlanta, please let me know where you think we should meet up. Send me an email, liz at benfranklinsworld.com. Okay, are you ready to explore the world of the 18th century British Empire from a Scottish Highland point of view? Then let me introduce you to our guest historian. Our guest is an assistant professor of history at the United States Naval Academy. His expertise is in British and British imperial history. He's written several articles and a book, The Fatal Land, War, Empire, and the Highland Soldier in British America. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Matthew P. Jeanick. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. I really appreciate it. Well, Matthew, we're really excited to have you so we can learn more about the Scottish Highlanders who served in British North America. Speaking of which, In his book, The Fatal Land, War, Empire, and the Highland Soldier in British America, Matthew seeks to better understand the British Empire by trying to understand the history of the Scottish Highlands and the Highlanders' involvement in the British Army. Matthew, I wonder if we could start with the Scottish Highlands, because it seems to me that if we're going to understand the 18th century Highland soldier, then we should probably know something about where he came from. So would you tell us about the Highlands, where they're located, and where they fit within the British Empire during the 1700s? Yeah, absolutely. So, in effect, the Highlands and Islands, what Gaels themselves know as the Gaeltoch, are kind of the upper and western third of Scotland. You know, it's a third of the landmass of Scotland, but a very small percentage of the overall population. And effectively, this region is kind of somewhat divided from the rest of Scotland on account of climate and on account of land use. So, you know, the, the best estimates are that only about 9 or 10% of the highlands is actually suitable for cultivation. So this created a very different kind of social and cultural and economic dynamic for the highlands compared with the rest of Scotland. And in terms of the empire, the highlands kind of stand, along with Ireland, at least the most problematic part of the British Empire in the 18th century. This is an area where political autonomy is very strong, where a distinctive cultural and socioeconomic system is very strong, 
and where a propensity to support opposition to Hanoverian Britain really makes this a problematic region for the British Empire. Only 9 to 10 percent of the Scottish Highlands were able to be cultivated? How in the world were the Highlanders able to live in the 18th century if they couldn't really farm their land? It's tricky. A great deal of the wealth in the Highlands in the 18th century revolves around cattle. And increasingly in the 18th century, Highland cattle are actually supplying lowland and English markets with beef. And as industrialization takes hold in lowland Scotland and England, they're requiring more and more meat coming into the cities. And so an awful lot of Highlanders are very apt at working within this kind of pan-British economy to supply what is needed. Unfortunately, on the flip side of that, of course, for the very lowest margins of Highland society, trying to eke out a subsistence existence in a very, very comparatively poor climate becomes very difficult. And famine and you know economic downturns are quite a regular occurrence. They occur in almost every decade of the second half of the 18th century. In describing the Highlands, you mentioned Hanoverian England and the fact that there were some tensions between the Scottish Highlanders and the English crown. So would you tell us something about Hanoverian England? Like what historians mean when they use that term and why there were tensions between the Hanoverian monarchs and the Scottish Highlanders? I will try. Much better historians than me have struggled to explain it. But I think in effect, in the 17th century, the Scottish crown makes a concerted effort to try and extend some sort of political authority jurisdiction over the Highlands. And it's relatively successful. The result of that means that when the Glorious Revolution happens in England in 1688, when the English Parliament decides that they want to get rid of the House of Stuart, which was originally a Scottish crown, but had come also down to England in 1603, it means that people in Scotland, and particularly the Scottish margins, look to support deposed Stuart House. The fact that Highlanders kind of recognize that monarchical systems are slightly less imposing on them than perhaps a parliamentary system would be. And as a result of that, they tend to support the exiled Stuart House rather than the replacement Hanoverian House. The other part of this, of course, is that most Highlanders in this period are Episcopalians, kind of high church liturgy Episcopalians, which means supporting the established monarchy as opposed to a kind of wigged-backed Hanoverian state makes sense to them. You know, in broad strokes, we've just talked about the economics, politics, and religious ideas of the Scottish Highlands, but we haven't really discussed their demography. So would you tell us about the Highlanders themselves, the people who lived in the Highlands? As I say, the Highlanders referred to the Highlands and Islands as the Gaeltoch, the land of the Gaels. Language was their primary identifier of difference. This is a fundamentally oral culture, although with increasing publications of books, the number of Gallic books expands exponentially in the 18th century, but it's fundamentally an oral culture. Politically, it's based around a system of kinship known as the clan system, which effectively kind of elevates a particular chief or landowner and maintains him in a position to kind of provide social stability. The fact that wealth is also in cattle means that this is obviously a movable property that's very easy to take away from somebody. So the clan system also provides a kind of defense mechanism against raids into your territory. And for many Highlanders coming of age in the 17th and 18th century, the idea of the raid, a raid on a neighboring clan's cattle, the kriach, was something that was fundamental to their emergence as a person. Now, in terms of the overall population of Highlanders, there's actually not that many. In the mid-18th century, the best estimate, although this has been challenged in a number of places, is there's about 350,000 Highlanders. That means that about 30% of the Scottish population and maybe no more than 5% of the mainland British population. The clan system has an incredible kind of social power. People do look up to their chiefs. People do associate their strength and their abilities with the character of their chiefs. That said, even in the mid-17th century, there are already fundamental shifts going on in clan culture. These chiefs are increasingly moving away to the centres, Edinburgh and even to London. 
They're increasingly moving towards monetarized rents rather than rents based on military service to the chief. And they're increasingly kind of divided from their people. And that has a profound effect on Highland life into the 18th century. I think when many of us think about Scottish culture today, our brains immediately take us to this Highlander culture we've been discussing because we see it in movies, we read about it in books. And yet you mentioned that Highlanders only represented maybe 30 percent of the Scottish population in the mid 18th century. So now I wonder who made up the other 70 percent of the Scottish people? (laughs) There can be only one. Basically, lowland Scots are largely uh, Anglo-Scottish, so they are speaking English and they are also speaking Scots, which many consider a distinct language from English, and it very much is. Those in the urban centres are increasingly speaking what we'd nowadays call the Queen's English, and they're trying to get rid of their Scotticisms. In the 18th century, this is a period in which As Scotland becomes part of the British Empire after the 1707 Act of Union with England, Scottish elites are trying to suppress their distinctiveness in order to advertise themselves as kind of modern, forward-thinking, commercially-minded participants in the British Empire. They're also, these lowland Scots tend to be Presbyterian, and so there is a slight, you know, religious component there. The irony, of course, and one of the probably biggest reasons why today we associate Scottish culture in general with Highland culture in the 18th century is that by the end of the 18th century, as industrialization really takes hold and as these Scottish elites have become very successful in advertising themselves to be commercial, there's a kind of reaction against that, a romantic reaction against that. And they suddenly worry that we're no longer Scottish. And so they look for things that can make them as Scottish as possible. And of course, the culture of the Highlands, the dress, the language, things like bagpipes, you know, these cultural symbols become the way of doing that. It sounds like in the 18th century, Scotland was a diverse place that basically had two different groups of people. And Matthew wonders how these two populations got along with each other. So were there any conflicts that existed between the Scottish Highlanders and Lowlanders during the 18th century? Yeah, it's a great question. There are two ways of looking at it. On the one hand, there is conflict. Lowland Scots tend to be some of the most virulent anti-Gales, the ones that reject Gallic culture the strongest. You know, for many people living in England, Gallic culture wouldn't have meant very much. But for those in Lowland Scotland, it is these clans to the north are arguably an existential threat. And this dates back all the way to the 14th century. Since the 14th century, the first kind of understandings of division between Lowland and Highland had started to come into place. There's a very famous story when the Scottish Parliament was re-established in 1999. A reporter went up to Skye, which is in the Gale Talk, and asked a farmer there, a crofter, you must be delighted to have a Scottish Parliament. And he answered, I think it's a terrible idea. And the reporter saying, you know, why is that? He goes, well, the people in London have never cared about us, but the people in Edinburgh have always hated us. And so, you know, there's that kind of strange division, even within a small nation like Scotland. On the other hand, I think it's important not to overdo the sense of hostility. You know, there was a common identifier of being Scottish. Even though the Highlands were politically somewhat autonomous, they understood themselves to be Scots and they celebrated being Scottish as well as being Gales. You've got increased interaction as the economy begins to bind people together in 18th century Britain. You've got Highland chiefs living in Edinburgh. You've got Highland poets like Donachaban Machentoyer living in Edinburgh and serving in kind of the city guard in Edinburgh. You've got increasing interactions more broadly. So I think it's important not to overemphasize this hostility. Now, earlier you told us about the Highlands and its politics, and you noted that many Highlanders supported the House of Stuart over the House of Hanover, which replaced them. So I wonder if you would tell us more about the relationship between the Highlanders and the Hanoverian monarchs, and whether any aspects of this relationship factored into the Jacobite Rebellion of 1745. Yeah, absolutely. And this is a really interesting question. This, In many respects, this is the kind of starting point for major discussions in the kind of modern history of Scotland. To what extent did Scotland remain favourable to the House of Stuart and the Jacobite cause? 
Put simply, there are four major armed uprisings, armed rebellions against the Hanoverian state, or at least the, you know, the state of William and Mary, and then the Hanoverian state from 1715. There's four of them that occur between 1690 and 1745. All of them begin in the Highlands, and all of them are accompanied by state efforts to kind of reduce the power of the Highland clans following these rebellions. So on the one hand, it is quite obvious that the Highlands are a source of the best hopes for the House of Stuart of a restoration. And the House of Stuart in exile in France and Italy does focus a great deal of attention on the Highlands. At the same time, increasingly, a great number of Highland chiefs, Highland clans are kind of moving toward a rapprochement with the Hanoverian regime. The rising in 1715 is the biggest one. It has the broadest popular support, and there are many clans involved in it. By 1745, support has actually declined quite precipitously, and you tend to find the Jacobites of 1745 tend to be the more marginal elements of society. These are people that have often been left behind in some of the commercial revolutions. They tend to be aristocrats that are a little bit down on their luck. One of the difficulties we've had for historians is the 1745 rebellion is actually the one that gets closest to London and closest to actually re-establishing the House of Stuart, which means we've, in a sense, misunderstood just how quickly Highlanders in particular are moving towards a basic understanding with the Hanoverian regime. Many chiefs in 1745 were happy to send one son out to join the Jacobites and hedge their bets by sending another son to join the Hanoverians. And it's also the case that the Hanoverian state manages to raise somewhere in the region of about 4,000 militia in the Highlands during the rebellion. So the idea that the Highlands are uniformly behind the House of Stuart doesn't quite work historically. Yeah, wow. And it really does sound like people in the Highlands were hedging their bets by sending one son to fight for the Hanoverians and the other to fight with the Jacobites. Yes, absolutely they are. And, you know, they'd seen the result of previous rebellions. And honestly, for most people, as in most civil wars and rebellions, a lot of them just want to stay at home, to stay as far out of the political realm as they possibly can. Unfortunately for them, something like an armed rebellion and one that in particular that lasts almost a year it's very difficult to stay on the sidelines. That's an interesting point in question. If you have sons fighting in both armies, did that make these uprisings, or at least the 1745 uprising, civil wars? And would you tell us something about the penultimate battle of that 1745 uprising, the Battle of Culloden? Yeah, absolutely. The Battle of Culloden is a traumatic event in the history of the Highlands. The Jacobite army, which had marched within a couple of days of London in late 1745. By April 1746, is back in Inverness, is starving. The troops are beginning to go home. There's a lot of desertions. They're exhausted. They've been pushed. Despite winning most of the battles, they've really been strategically outwitted. The battle itself is distinctly one-sided, and it's a horrible affair. Government troops, which outnumber the Jacobites almost two to one, pound the Jacobite army for a significant amount of time with long-range artillery before the Highland charge goes in. The charge actually does pierce the government line, but they haven't got the momentum to keep going, and the rest of the battle is, in effect, something close to a rout and a massacre. And in the immediate aftermath of the battle, the government army imposed an absolute kind of state-sponsored terrorism. They went through Highland Glens, they murdered people, civilians who had just been kind of standing on the sidelines during the battle. They raced into Inverness, murdered civilians there. It's a traumatic and horrifying experience. You should also note, however, that this very much is a civil war. The Battle of Culloden featured Scottish regiments on the government side. One of the units that kind of wheeled round the Jacobite flank was a unit known as the Argyle Militia. And these were Highlanders, Gaelic speakers, wearing the belted plaid, the traditional dress of the Highlands, actually attacking other Gales in the closing stages of the battle. So this is very much a civil war. The ultimate result is the end of 1746 sees the state really try to impose its will on the Highlands in an unprecedented way. 
and they introduce all sorts of kind of legislation designed to break the power of the Highland clans. Research I've been doing of late and research done by, you know, a couple of other folk, uh, Andrew McKillop and Alan McInnes, is suggesting that this kind of state-sponsored terrorism or oppression is not as effective as we might assume. Nevertheless, it is a major kind of traumatic event. Was it the trauma caused by the Battle of Culloden why so many historians have pointed to this battle as the beginning of the end of Scotland's Gaelic culture? I think so. I think in many respects it's become shorthand for a wider discussion about the emergence of a kind of Anglo-British culture. I think to an extent it's unfair. In the late 19th century, there were still as many Gaelic speakers in the Highlands as there had been 100 years earlier. What really hurts Gaelic culture more generally is a kind of increased commercial interactions with lowland Scotland and the South, which kind of promotes English as a language of commerce and also public education, a kind of standardized education that begins to emerge in the late 19th century more vigorously. And that, of course, is in English. It's not the case that Culloden's completely irrelevant to the story, you know, and certainly Culloden forces government intervention in more serious ways. There are agents of kind of cultural change that come into the Highlands. The SSPCK, the Scottish Society for the Propagation of Christian Knowledge, do come into the Highlands in kind of more vigorous ways. After Culloden, there are efforts to kind of quote unquote civilize the Highlanders through state sponsored promotion of industry. So it's not completely irrelevant, but I do think that the kind of romantic idea of this lost cause and the traumatic nature of the battle and the suppression of Gaelic Scotland after the rebellion is a convenient shorthand for historians that does a little injustice to the reality. Now, after the Jacobite defeat at the Battle of Culloden, many Highlanders chose to enlist in the British Army. Matthew, this situation seems perplexing. So why was it that so many Highlanders joined the British Army after Culloden? And why did the British Army even want Highlanders as soldiers? Yeah, that's was it the $6 million question. First, as I was saying, to a certain extent, the idea that, you know, the Highlanders have to undergo this significant volt fast in order to become, you know, used to the Hanoverian regime is probably not all that accurate. So it's perhaps not as perplexing as we might assume. That said, there are quite a number of former Jacobites, even veterans of Culloden, who end up in the British Army and who end up serving in North America with Highland regiments in the service of the British state. So it is interesting. I think first and foremost, the tradition of political autonomy in the Highlands meant that Highlanders were very good at kind of adapting to new realities. They would do whatever was necessary in order to retain those elements of their society that they needed. Therefore, once the rebellion is done, and once it becomes obvious the House of Stuart is probably most likely a dead cause, it doesn't require much from Highlanders simply to bend their sails to the Hanoverian wind. On an individual basis, I think it's very much a question of kind of push and pull factors. Military service is a steady job. And not only is it a steady job, it's consistent with a kind of tradition of seasonal migration. Because of the difficulties of living in the Highlands, seasonal migration to jobs in lowland Scotland was a very common thing in the 18th century. And in many respects, military service is an extension of this kind of seasonal migration. It's also consistent with a tradition in the Highlands whereby military service was offered in return for security of tenure. In the clan system, you got land and secured your land through providing military service to the chief. The British state is very good at adapting that model. And many recruiters, people raising these regiments, actually explicitly say to Highlanders, if you provide a son for the army, we will ensure that your family has security of tenure on your traditional land. The other part, obviously, is just the money. The government kind of has about a £3 bounty. That's the idea that every soldier signing up gets £3 in their hand as a reward for signing up. Now, in reality, of course, most soldiers did not see this money. It was, you know, taken away to pay for their clothing and their food and all that. Nevertheless, in some Highland counties by the 1780s during the American Revolution, 
you're looking at £15 of bounty being offered in order to convince Highlanders to enlist. And when you're likely maybe to make three or four pounds per annum as an unskilled laborer, 15 pounds is a tremendous amount of money. So I think for all these reasons, that helps explain, to some extent, Highland interest in military service. It should also be noted that traditional clan culture did have a very highly celebrated militarized aspect to it. So we can't dismiss the idea for young Gallic men the idea of adventure, the idea of heroism, the idea of being celebrated by you know, future poets, the idea even of sexual reward as a result of their services is something we also need to take into account. So when historians look at all these different push and pull factors, are they able to arrive at an estimate of just how many Highlanders chose to serve in the British ranks? And are they able to tell us why the British Army wanted Highlanders within its ranks? Because as we talked about, Highlanders weren't always the biggest supporters of the British state. In effect, the British state deploys about 12,000 Highlanders to North America between the Seven Years' War and the American War of Independence, which is not astronomical in the grand scheme of things. It is nevertheless the most highly mobilized part of the British Atlantic world in this era. You're looking at kind of one in five young Highland males potentially taking part in military service at any one time, when for the rest of Britain, that that figure is probably about one in eight. And a lot of that includes home service as well. And that is where, you know, kind of militia service where you wouldn't be dispatched overseas. So having one in five in these regiments being dispatched overseas is quite a significant number. Now, for the state, you know, the traditional argument often was basically it gets dangerous Jacobites out of Scotland. You can recruit them in the army, you can send them to die in the wilds of North America, and, you know, it's win win. And you do have people that make this argument. You do have people like the Duke of Cumberland in particular, who had commanded the government army at Culloden and who is the son of the monarch, make that case. At the same time, Highland regiments, like any other regiment in the 18th century army, is a valuable resource. You know, you don't send them to be cannon fodder. It's extremely expensive to raise men. It takes a long time to train them. And therefore, just to let them die is something no sensible military commander really ever wants to do. So there's a couple of reasons that the British state turned Highlanders. To a certain extent, it's about matching the French in terms of French advantages in petty guerre, small war. The French have a distinctive advantage in terms of their alliances with indigenous North Americans, at least before things like the Treaty of Easton in 1758 and the kind of desertion of indigenous peoples away from the French. So the idea is Highlanders are kind of these natural mountainous warriors and they will be able to fight indigenous North Americans on fair terms. There's also a demographic question as well. This is a untapped military resource by and large. Now, there had been Highlanders, obviously, in the army prior to the Jacobite Rebellion. But by and large, this is a relatively undertapped resource. And so it seems ludicrous for the state to turn down the possibility of recruiting more men. The other part of this is that as English and lowland society increasingly industrializes, Labor for the industrial cities becomes a resource to be protected. And the assumption is because Highlanders live in this, you know, supposed backwater, this supposedly commercially repressed area to the north, they are better people to recruit because it will insulate industrial workers from military recruitment. So there's definite advantages for the state in this regard. Now, I believe you said that the British Army sent something like 17,000 Highlanders to North America between 1754 and 1783. Do we know what their experience in North America was like? Could you tell us how they experienced the French and Indian or Seven Years' War? I think it was about 12,000 in total, although by the time you take into account guys who were also sent to India, you're getting towards a much higher number of perhaps as many as 20,000. Put simply, the experience is a hard one, to say the least. Even though you don't obviously want to send your soldiers to be cannon fodder, the nature of 18th century warfare, in particular disease, really means that Highland troops generally suffered in North America. 
battalions that were recruited, you know, with about 1,200 men when Highland troops are sent over in 1757. It was quite common for there to be no less than 100 of them by the end of the Seven Years' War. The Black Watch, Amfrekha Jindu, the 42nd Foot is a great example. They are a Highland regiment. They're the oldest Highland regiment. They arrive in North America in 1758. They lose almost two-thirds of their strength in a doomed assault on what became Fort Ticonderoga in July 1758. After that, they take part in the campaign against Montreal. They're then sent to the West Indies in 1761, where they lose another 44% of what's left. The result of which is by the time they get back to New York, there are not many left. Many of the companies are down to, you know, a, a dozen individuals. In total, like three Highland regiments, which should have numbered, you know, well over 3,000 guys in 1764, number about 300. They've lost 90% of their people. So it is not a great experience by any stretch of the imagination. One thing that kind of makes those figures make a little more sense, of course, is these are not all troops who are being killed or dying of disease. An awful lot of them are being discharged, either because they are old or because they're worn out or they've been injured or they have participated in some meritorious action and the colonel is sympathetic towards them. So an awful lot of them are being discharged. Others are also deserting and just trying to get away from the army. So not all of these people are being killed. Nevertheless, it is a hard, a hard service. Now, the end of the French and Indian or Seven Years' War came with a British victory over the French in 1763. And Marie wonders what the end of this war meant for the Highland soldiers in North America. Specifically, she wonders if any of the soldiers chose to stay and make North America home. Yeah, it's a great question, Marie. There's actually a significant number that do. We haven't got exact statistics for all of the regiments. Nevertheless, depending on the regiment, depending on where the regiment ends up, depending on the process of its demobilization, anywhere between about 20 and 40 percent of Highland soldiers who are still with the regiment at the end of the Seven Years' War end up choosing to remain in North America. It's highly likely that that figure would have been even more. But one of the things that the British state does, which is very cheeky, is to draft some of these troops into other regiments. So many of these Highlanders enlist on the basis of only serving for the duration of the war. And then by a kind of slight of hand at the end of the war, the British state says, well, you are now drafted into a regiment where service is for life. And you can only imagine what these guys thought of that. But it's about 20 to 40 percent. They get land under what's known as the Royal Proclamation of 1763. And the Royal Proclamation is basically this effort to kind of populate North America, to make sure that commercial expansion of the British Empire in North America continues unhindered. And so, generally speaking, it's about 50 acres are offered to every private soldier. So an awful lot of these Highlanders end up settling in both upper New York in areas actually that eventually became places like New Hampshire and Vermont, and also in Quebec, in Canada. These are the kind of main concentrations of settlement. And what did the Highlanders make of life in New Hampshire, New York, and Quebec? Did they ever attempt to reestablish the Highland way of life in these areas? That's certainly the interpretation of a kind of older traditional historiography, that somehow Highlanders are, you know, so traditional that no matter where they are, they just want to recreate Highland life. That's definitely true in terms of culture, you know, and there are places in Canada today, obviously Cape Breton being the most prominent, where Gaelic culture is still incredibly strong. There's a Gaelic college there on Cape Breton, which is a wonderful place, and you can do kind of online learning in the Gaelic language through them. In terms of trying to re-establish Highland social systems, this is not the case. And what's really funny to me and what I find very interesting, what I try and outline a little bit in the book, is that it's traditionally imagined that all these Highlanders kind of want to remain with their chiefs or remain with their officers out of this kind of hangover of clanship, this sense of obligation to their social superiors. The reality, as far as I can tell from the sources, is that that was the last thing on their minds. In actual fact, an awful lot of these officers and clan chiefs feel very much offended by how the more common soldiers and the common Highlanders treat them. 
Because once you get to North America, land and jobs, they're far more open and possible than they are in the Highlands. Labor shortages means you can get quite a lot for your labor. There's always more land, which means the desire to reestablish a clanship system, which is based on the subsistence economy, based on threats to your movable property, do not exist in North America in the same way. And therefore, most Highlanders are not all that keen to see a reestablishment of the old social system. Okay, so earlier we discussed how there were four major uprisings in the Highlands between the 1680s and 1740s. And between the 1680s and 1783, there happened to be four great wars for empire in North America. And that last war happened to be the American War for Independence. Matthew, do we know what Highlanders thought about the American colonists and their decision to rebel or stage an uprising against the British state? Yes, we do, to an extent. One kind of caveat or one kind of qualifier to this is we do have a significant amount of writing from the perspective of the middling taxman class or the elites. These are the kind of upper and middle ranks of Highland society. They were obviously literate and the vast majority of them wrote in English. And so we do have a fair amount of evidence about how they saw the American revolutionaries. And by and large, they're very unfavorable. In fact, Highlanders were probably some of the most consistent opponents of American independence. And the reason for this is, first and foremost, a lot of them probably had experience of the Jacobite Rebellion. A lot of them had maybe grown up in this era. And the idea of resisting the British state is something that doesn't make a lot of sense, particularly early on in the war before it's obvious you know, just how successful the revolutionaries are going to be. The second thing is an awful lot of these Highlanders, or at least the middling and upper ranks, are attached to Britain. They are serving officers, they are former serving officers, they have state pensions, they have their own estates are kind of integrated into the wider British economy, they are entrepreneurs in the cattle trade. So their entire lives, our economic lives, kind of centered around a process in which they are joined with the rest of Britain. From an ideological point of view, some understandings and remnants of the intellectual parts of clanship definitely survive. In traditional Gallic culture, fighting for what was right, kyarst, what was deserved, what was proper, was very much emphasized. And loyalty to the established monarch is seen as something that is to be praised and supported. It doesn't take all that much from Highlanders to understand the House of Stuart being the proper monarch and therefore supporting it to by the period of the American Revolution saying, well, the Hanoverian monarch is the monarch now, but it's still a monarchy and therefore we owe our allegiance to that monarchy. And it's quite fascinating to read the writings of folk like Adam Ferguson, who is a member of the Scottish literati, he's a, a prominent Scottish Enlightenment thinker, but he also serves as the chaplain of one of the Highland regiments. And he writes from New York in 1776 as he's serving against the revolutionaries, at least what we did in 1745, we were wrong, but we did it for the right reasons. You know, the American revolutionaries just want to, you know, throw everything up in the air and destroy the framework of society. And therefore, that is the distinction between Highland rebels in 1745 and American rebels in 1775. Given this Highland ambivalence and even disapproval of the American Revolution, did many Highland Scots enlist in the British Army to quell the American Rebellion? Yes, they did. And they signed up for broadly the same reasons they'd signed up in the Seven Years' War, the bounty money, the opportunity, the sense of reward. So yes, they do. It is less likely that a great number of Highlanders really certainly at the lower levels, really had any strong ideological inclinations either way. Fighting American revolutionaries is probably, to their estimations, not all that different to fighting the French or fighting the kind of pan-Indian confederacy of Pontiac in 1763. So yes, they do sign up in significant numbers. They are also significantly directly promised land at the end of the war. Recruiting posters published in Scotland for Highland regiments explicitly say that the lands of rebels will be given to the British state and then passed on to you. 
And given that the confiscation of estates is something that had accompanied the Jacobite rebellions, to many Highlanders looking at this, it seems perfectly natural that once this American rebellion is suppressed, the state will go in, confiscate property, and then redistribute it to its loyal supporters, which will obviously include Highlanders in the army. So the British had to conduct a bit of a propaganda campaign to create interest in fighting the Americans. Yeah. And I think if there is a broader meaning to maybe what I was trying to do in the book, to a certain extent, it's talking about how easily people fall into the empire trap. Empires that are successful, like the British Empire, do a very good job of making imperial imperatives consistent with the interests of constituent parts of their empire. And so by directly appealing to the reward of land in North America, you are satisfying an existing understanding of military service and an existing desire within Gallic Scotland. And the British state is remarkably successful in doing this. Now, Kelly wonders whether any of the Highlanders chose to join the Americans in their fight against the British state, and whether and how their experiences from the Jacobite Rebellion of 1745 may have informed their decision to join the revolutionaries' efforts. Yeah, it's a great question. While it is certainly the case that Highlanders are very consistent supporters generally of the British state during the American Revolution, there are a number of Highlanders who side with the revolutionaries. What's interesting about them is that most of them had been in the American colonies for a significant length of time, which means that they've forged economic connections with the Anglo-American society of North America. Probably the most famous is a guy called Lachlan Mackintosh. Lachlan Mackintosh is a brilliant character. He also has the rather dubious distinction of actually having killed the signer of the Declaration of Independence in a duel. Lachlan Mackintosh is from a Jacobite family. Um, he grew up in a place called Rates. Unfortunately, the village is no longer there. There was an awful lot of these communities were cleared during what we know as the Highland Clearances. But he comes over to America in the 1730s as part of the settlement of Georgia. And the British state is trying to put people into Georgia because it really is a frontier zone with Spanish North America. Lachlan Mackintosh, he lives in Georgia for 10 years. When the Jacobite Rebellion occurs in Scotland, he actually plans to jump ship and go back to Scotland to participate in the Jacobite Rebellion. But he's convinced not to bother, which is probably a very smart decision. He ends up becoming the clerk of Henry Lawrence, who is, of course, a very prominent revolutionary. And Lachlan Mackintosh really takes the lead in the Highland or Scottish settlement of Darien, Georgia. He's the kind of main instigator of revolutionary activity there. He ends up raising the 1st Georgia Regiment of the Continental Line and goes on to serve as a brigadier commander in the Continental Army. So, yeah, there are certainly Jacobite connections. There's also, you know, maybe Lowland Scots or Aberdeenshire Scots as well, who end up serving with the revolutionaries who have Jacobite pass. Hugh Mercer, who is, I believe, unfortunately killed at Princeton, he was also a former Jacobite who ends up fighting with the revolutionaries. So which signer did Lachlan Mackintosh kill in a duel? Yeah, it's Button Gwinnett, one of the signers for Georgia, kind of represented the more radical Whig faction in Georgia. And he kind of upset Lachlan Mackintosh when he replaced him as head of the 1st Georgia Regiment. He also accused Lachlan's brother of treason, leading Lachlan to make this big declaration where he called Button Gwinnett a scoundrel and a lying rascal. And as we know, you know, that sort of language, you know, is almost a guarantee of a duel in the 18th century. Both Button and Lachlan are injured in this duel. Unfortunately for Button Gwinnett, I think the ball passed into his thigh and severed an artery. So he ended up dying while Lachlan recovered. So earlier, we discussed how every time Great Britain came to North America to fight a war, there were soldiers who came to stay after the fighting. But unlike the three previous wars for empire, Great Britain lost a lot of possession in North America during the revolution. So Matthew, did any Scottish soldiers choose to stay in the United States after the war rather than go back to Britain? Yeah, a significant number again. One of the statistics I kind of came up with in the book, which really struck me, was traditionally it's the German mercenaries, what we inaccurately refer to as the Hessians, who have this reputation for staying in America and carrying on, you know, living in North America after the revolution. 
actually there's a higher percentage of Highland Scots stay in North America after the revolution than Hessians. So that's a kind of interesting take on this. We don't know all that much about those who remained in the United States or what became the United States. And that's where genealogists can really help us and really advance our historical understanding a great deal. There are a number of Highland prisoners taken during the war, and most of them end up in Virginia or in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And in fact, Thomas Jefferson is actually very keen to bring some Highland prisoners to Virginia because it's kind of evidence of the benevolent effects of the revolution. If you can incorporate a former enemy into your society is a good propaganda victory for your political idea. We do know much more about those who ended up in Canada. The British state, by and large, keeps its promises and rewarded lands, predominantly in Nova Scotia, but also in Ontario. Again, they were offered a certain amount of land, depending on their rank. What we find in this case is an awful lot of NCOs grouped together in order to pool their resources and establish slightly larger estates that they would try and work together as, a, in a sense, a community. The problem is that Nova Scotia in the 1780s is not exactly the land of milk and honey. Most of it is still uncleared. And it would have taken the average man, you know, a single family, about a year to clear two or three acres of ground. When you're being awarded 50 acres, that sounds like quite a lot. But often this land was not of the best quality. Often this land did not have easy connections to markets. And of course, it's no good, you know, having this land if you can't actually produce for market. So an awful lot of these soldiers, while they keep their lands, tend to gravitate towards emerging centers like Halifax or Windsor in order to take wage labor where they can demand relatively high sums for labor based on the relative scarcity of labor in Nova Scotia. Matthew, before we move into the time warp, I wonder if you would tell us why you think it's important that we attempt to understand the history and experiences of the Highland soldier in North America. What is it you think this understanding can do for our knowledge of the British Empire and for our knowledge of the British Empire in 18th century North America? That's the big question. It's a wonderful question. I think first and foremost, an awful lot of what I've been trying to do to a certain extent is iconoclastic. Highlanders have a very strong mythology around them. And while that is in many respects good, and you know, I tell people I'm a Highlander and, and they have all sorts of ideas about me, it's also potentially very damaging. And in the worst cases, it is still the case today that the Scottish Highlands have one of the highest suicide rates amongst young men in Britain. And part of that, at least, is this kind of macho, tough culture, uh, the culture of the clans. When you're told that you are heroic warriors, it's hard to remember that that's not necessarily the case for everybody. So understanding Highland experience is really important from a kind of breaking of mythology point of view. I think it also, as I was saying, tells us an awful lot about the appeal of empire, why empires succeed, because in many respects they are appealing. Empire, at least prior to the modern age, was the kind of most common form of political organization on the planet. And the vast majority of humans have lived under some form of empire rather than nation state. So understanding what the appeal of empire is, how empires kind of draw people into opportunities, both collective and personal, I think is really important. I also think there's an agency question here as well. While the British state is a kind of really strong actor, while it has this ability to shift people where it wants, to draft them into the new regiments if they want at the end of the war, there's a tremendous amount of agency that remains at the lowest level of society. And even in this kind of deeply unequal and hierarchical world, many of these Highland soldiers found ways of challenging their allotted place in society. And I think that's a really important story. I think it also kind of reveals the sophistication of Highland society. I think for too long, we've kind of had this view the Highlanders sit in their crofts, staring at a fire and waiting for something to happen to them. This is very much a story of Highlanders looking at the world, looking outward, looking at empires, looking at North America, of traveling back and forth, sometimes multiple times, 
between the Highlands and North America and the West Indies. And also thinking in quite deep and constructive ways about what empire is, what it does, and what their military service means. And I think finally, in terms of North America specifically, I think the experience of Highland soldiers reveals how the British state was able to kind of harness and promote opportunities between constituent parts of the empire. Highlanders had a much deeper connection with North America than they had with other parts of the British Empire. And to a certain extent, North America is still sometimes referred to in the Gaelic language as Chirayali, the promised land. The ability of the British state to manipulate that and profit from it is something that I think tells us a great deal about how empire works. Now let's jump into the time warp. This is the fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently, or if someone had acted differently. In your opinion... What might have happened if the Highlanders had refused to join the British Army? How might the outcome of the Seven Years' War and the American Revolution have been different if Highlanders had refused to enlist? Wow. Um, what is it they say that the future's not my period? If Highlanders had refused to enlist, a number of things would have happened. First and foremost, during the Seven Years' War, Scots make up almost 30% of the British Army in North America. So if you imagine straight off the bat, losing 30% of your potential strength in North America is very significant. This would have had a knock-on effects in all sorts of ways. The British state would have had to focus its recruitment on other places. So they might have gone to England, which may have damaged kind of industrialization in England. They may have gone to whites living in North America. That may have had the potential to kind of bring North Americans more into the imperial system than was formerly the opportunity. Famously, George Washington was constantly asking for a commission in the British regular army. If that had happened, you may not have seen the progress of the American Revolution, or at least support for the American Revolution, in quite the same way. Although that's obviously attributing an awful lot to a small element of the American Revolution story. The British state might also have gone to maybe other allies, African Americans, indigenous North Americans, which would have had obviously a profound impact on the attitudes of white settlers to the British Empire in North America. It's also the case, I think, more generally, if Highlanders hadn't embraced the empire, you would have had an area of the British Isles that was not yet completely secure for the Hanoverian dynasty. And this obviously has all sorts of knock-on effects in terms of Britain's global standing. One of the things that's now said about the Battle of Culloden is that it was a major event in world history because it secured the Hanoverian regime and allowed them to focus their energies externally rather than internally. And it also obviously removed kind of France's potential ally within the British Isles. So ultimately, if Highlanders had not enlisted, you could be looking at a very, very different British North America, and indeed British Empire. Now, Matthew, you teased earlier that you have chosen a new research project. Is it something you can tell us about? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you very much for asking. What I'm doing currently, actually, is I'm looking at more broadly in a kind of global sense at British recruitment policies among indigenous peoples and colonial peoples. And basically what I'm trying to do is look at the ways in which British recruitment of these people changes the culture and political and economic parameters of the British Empire. And I'm looking across a broader swathe from the Seven Years' War all the way through the Age of Revolutions. And my hope is by applying some of the same kind of lessons from the Scottish Highlands more globally, we can understand a British Empire that very much depended upon the interaction between colonial recruits and the British state. And how can we get in touch with you if we have more questions about the Scottish Highlands and the soldiers it sent to North America? Well, first and foremost, please, anybody should feel free to contact me. I'd be delighted to speak to anybody. The best way to contact me is at my email address, which is mdz 
I E N N I at USNA dot edu, or go on to the United States Naval Academy History Department website and just look for Matthew Janique there. Matthew Janique, thank you for joining us and for helping us better understand the history of the Scottish Highlands and the history of how Highlands and Highlanders fit within the history of the British Empire. I am so honored. Thank you so much. During the 18th century, Ireland and the Scottish Highlands proved to be the two most problematic regions of the British Isles. And this is interesting to think about, because when we think about the British Empire during the 18th century and troublesome areas for the empire, we often think of England and its colonies in North America and the Caribbean. Towards the middle and end of the 18th century, we might also think about places in India. But how many of us really think about Scotland as a problem for the British Empire? And yet, as Matthew revealed, the Scottish Highlands proved to be a troublesome area through the end of the last Jacobite Rebellion in 1745. Why? The people of the Scottish Highlands were culturally distinct from the people of England and even from the people of lowland Scotland. Highlanders spoke the Gaelic language, they value celebrated and governed through ties of kinship, and they also had a strong culture of military service. Highlanders were also predisposed to governing themselves as much as possible through their kinship and clan systems, which meant Highlanders often supported systems of imperial governance that allowed for as much autonomy as possible. And that seems to be why most Highlanders supported the return of the House of Stuart to the British crown. The Stuarts tended to prefer monarchy over parliament, and as such, Stuarts tended to leave the Highlanders to do largely as they pleased. The Hanoverian monarchs, on the other hand, tended to work more closely with Parliament, and Highlanders believed that Parliament and the Hanovers might impose a more strict oversight over their doings. And then, of course, there's the fact that the House of Stuart was a Scottish house, while the House of Hanover was a German house with English connections. Now, I know I've generalized a lot here about this complicated and fascinating period of English, Scottish, and British history. And if you'd like to know more about this history, send me an email, and I'll introduce you to some books and scholars who can help you. Now, given the Highlanders' propensity to support the House of Stuart over the House of Hanover, there were four major armed uprisings between 1690 and 1745. All of these uprisings originated in the Highlands, and all of them started because the English and British state sought to reduce the autonomy of the Highland clans. But after the last rising in 1745, and the devastating defeat the Highlanders suffered at the hands of the British army. Highlanders seemed to have made peace with the Hanoverians, and by and large, began to work with the Hanovers to protect and maintain British authority around its empire. In fact, as Matthew noted, the Highlands contributed 12,000 soldiers for service in North America. And between 1754 and 1783, these Highland soldiers defended the British state and acquired territory for it. Plus, after the Seven Years' War and the American Revolution, Highland soldiers made North America home. They established new homes, helped clear lands in Canada and the new United States, and started commercial businesses. So, how did this happen? How did Highlanders go from being opposed to the British Empire to being active supporters of it? Exploring the history of the Highlanders' relationship with the British Empire helps. This history allows us to see how Highlanders came to support and shape the British Empire and how some of the British Empire's biggest lessons in imperial governance took place at home in the British Isles instead of abroad in America. And one of the biggest homegrown lessons that British imperial authorities learned about imperial governance from Highlanders was that the more you can make your imperial imperatives consistent with the interests of those you govern, the easier it is to govern, promote, and protect the interests of your empire. For example, the British state needed men in its army to defend, protect, and promote its territories and interests. The Highlanders needed land, money, and opportunities for economic advancement. So the British state went to the Highlanders and said, if you join the army, we'll give you money. And after your service, we'll give you land in areas with new economic opportunities. So in this case, the British state connected the needs of its empire with the needs of those it governed, the Highlanders. This is an important lesson. Because if we want to understand the history of early America, then we must understand the appeal of empires and the opportunities they offered people. We need to understand the appeals and opportunities of empire, because much of the history of early America is a history of empire. Look for more information about Matthew, his book, The Fatal Land, plus notes for everything we talked about today on the show notes page. <laughs> 
benfranklinsworld.com slash 252. Friends tell friends about their favorite podcasts. So if you enjoyed this episode, please tell your friends and family about it. Production assistance for this podcast comes from the Omahundro Institute's digital projects team. Joseph Edelman, Martha Howard, Emily Sneff, Holly White, and Karen Wolf. And Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. Finally, you asked me for an episode about Scottish people in North America. And today, we started with a fairly wide view of their influence and importance. So I'd like to know what more you'd like to know. Tell me about it. Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute.